And now to our debate, we want to welcome you all to the trapezoid. This is a terrific opportunity for all of you to prove to voters you have the command of the issues, demonstrate your ability to debate your rivals and show off the passion you bring to the battle. And with that, let's introduce the candidates, Democrat Margaret Good, Libertarian Allison Foxall, and Republican James Buchanan. Each candidate will have 90 seconds for an opening statement. And by the luck of the draw, it was Allison Foxall. So Allison, take it away. Thank you, Alan, and thank you, ABC7, for hosting this debate. It's a great public service opportunity to show that, yes, there are three candidates in this race, not just two, like some might have you believe. I'm Allison Foxall. I'm the hometown girl. I was born and raised here. I love Sarasota. I attended St. Martha's Catholic School and graduated uh, from Booker High in 2006. I earned my Bachelor's of Fine Arts degree in Mass Communications with a focus in Graphic Design. I'm running for State House because I want to see Florida prosper. I want to see three things happen. One, we need to stop corporate welfare. And that includes industry welfare and sports welfare. Two, I want to see health care mostly deregulated a bit so we can lower those costs. And three, I want to see that we have occupational licensing mostly deregulated as well. Our representatives seem to be beholden to special interests and lobbyists and even their own internal party leadership. I want that to stop and I want to see true representation and I definitely want to see that representation be me and not the old parties sitting next to me. So I look forward to discussing the issues tonight and uh, showing Sarasota that um, I'm the right choice for to be their next representative for the State House. All right, thanks. James, 90 seconds. Alan, I'd like to start off by thanking you and ABC7 for hosting tonight's debate. And to Allison and Margaret, I look forward to a healthy discussion. Um, Sarasota is a place I grew up. This is actually where I met my wife. I was uh, blessed with the opportunity to start a business here and continue to grow it. My wife and I are raising our nine-month-old daughter here in the district. And so I feel so amazingly blessed to live here. But also, um, Sarasota is a place I love. There, there's no other place in the world I'd rather live. And I believe, I really believe we're at a, a turning point. We're at a crossroads here. Are we going to continue to fight for good paying jobs? Are we going to continue to fight for our veterans? Are we going to continue to fight for future generations? Are we going to continue to fight for our, coast, for our coastlines? Are we going to continue to fight to uphold the laws of the land? Or are we going to move backwards? You know, in high school, I played fullback at Cardinal Mooney, and I was blessed to go on to play at Florida State. And one thing I love more than anything, and as you know, football, fullback's not a glamorous position. The one thing I love more than anything was the opportunity to clear the way for my teammates on game day so they had success. If given that opportunity, I will fight for the men, women, and children of this district, and I look forward to our debate tonight. James, thank you. Margaret, 90 seconds. Alan, thank you so much for having me. And Allison and James, I'm happy to be here. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. My name is Margaret Good, and I am running for this House seat because I believe that Florida needs a change. I am fed up with the legislature in Tallahassee, not to mention Washington, D.C. My father was a fourth generation Floridian, and I grew up swimming in a pristine lake in central Florida. I go back to that lake today and it is too polluted to swim in and that's happened in our lifetime. The legislature in Tallahassee is not working for us. We are not getting the health care that we deserve. Our public education system is moving towards privatization and we are not, they are not moving to protect the environment like we, like we need them to. So when I get to Tallahassee, I'm going to be guided by three principles. Is it good for our environment? Is it good for our families? And when I'm thinking about our families, I'm thinking about the two and a half million Floridians that don't have access to health care. And I'm thinking about our public education system. And I'm gonna think about whether something's good for our economy. And when I'm thinking about our economy, I'm thinking about our local economy. I'm thinking about the people that work in Sarasota. I wanna make sure that they can afford to live here. And I wanna make sure that we have the policies in place to make sure that our small businesses thrive. All right, very good. We have to take a quick break and we'll be back in a moment with our first question, what might that be?
Welcome back. You are watching the first and only debate between all three candidates in the House 72 special election, Democrat Margaret Good, Libertarian Allison Foxhall, and Republican James Buchanan. And now for our top question, both of you did a fantastic job in laying out what you stand for. But as you know, legislators, you have to have your priorities when you get up there in terms of what bills you uh, pursue. So let's ask a multiple choice question. If you could have one bill that you could sponsor get passed and signed into law, what would it be? A bill dealing with sanctuary cities, a bill dealing with expanding or restricting gun rights, a bill that impacts middle class families trying to make ends meet, or a bill dealing with public education and vouchers? And Allison, we'll start with you. Are those the only choices, Alan? You, you know what, if there's something else you have a priori priority with, take it away. Well, I really want to see a bill that's comprehensive and deregulating occupational licensing. We're the most burdensome in the nation. We regulate almost 325 businesses and professions. I want to see that dramatically reduced so we create jobs in the markets and let the free market flourish. James? Alan, I, I think, uh, and I'm going to probably go in the same direction Allison went, uh, I think we have a major problem in this state with o the opioid crisis. And um, I do support Jim Boyd's legislation that he's put forward. But I do believe, moving forward, that we need to look at potentially other, uh, other options for that. So that's, that's one area I would consider pursuing. And Jim Boyd's uh, proposed law does what? Jim Boyd's law limits the number of days of which the opiate could be, um, uh, a, a doctor could prescribe an opiate, I think, to three days. OK, Margaret? Well, public education is so important, but I'm constantly talking to people on the doors and when I'm knocking on doors and they are saying that they're worried about their health care. There's two and a half million Floridians that don't have access to affordable health care in Florida. If we passed Medicaid expansion, then almost a million people would have the health care that they need. 90% of those funds would come from the federal government. It's taxes that we are already paying in. And I just read today that there's, that, that would be a net $500, $500 million uh, decrease in the cost that, that it was costing Florida to take care of, these, of the people that need health care. Why don't we move on to what might be the easiest question that you will be asked all night. James, you laid out your priorities, but why do you want to be a state representative? Well, for me, this is a district I grew up in. Uh, this is where I met my wife. Um, and this is where we're raising our child. So for me, it, it's simple. It's about making sure that we have good education and opportunities for our future generations, making sure that our people have good paying jobs in this community, and making sure that we're keeping this community uh, safe and secure. So those are the three top priorities I have in running. Not priorities, but why do you want the job? What is it about the job that you want to pursue? For me, it's all about the people, Alan. I grew up in this community. This is a community that that uh, I feel so deeply rooted in, and I want to go to work for the people. Right, Margaret, why do you want to be a state representative? I believe in public service. My father was an Episcopal priest, and my mother is a retired nurse. I grew up in a family that helped people, and that has been part of what I've done my entire life. As a lawyer, I advocate for people. Prior to going to law school, I worked in the nonprofit community, and I believe it's so important to give back and get, and make sure that we have good representation in Tallahassee. And I, I got fed up with what was happening in the legislature and decided it was time to say enough was enough. Enough and to and to run for this office. Allison, why do you want to be a state representative? Well, Alan, I'm really concerned about what was going on in Tallahassee. We saw Representative Miller resign, and uh, it it really it brought some concerns to me about what was going on with internal party leadership up in Tallahassee. I don't think that sending a Republican is going to help us, and I don't think sending a Democrat is going to help us either. I think one will obstruct and one will just toe the party line. So I think that for me as a libertarian, I think that I'm truly going to represent the people here and nothing else. I think we have uh, time for one more question in this block. You know, we uh, unfortunately in Florida had one of the worst mass shootings in U.S. history, and we've seen uh, others uh, just recently this fall. So the question would be, would you su be supportive of a new law that restricts high-capacity gun magazines, specifically magazines that can hold anywhere from 10 to 30 rounds? James? Alan, as you're aware, I'm a strong Second Amendment uh, supporter. And um, as it relates to, to this 
proposal. Uh, that would be something I'd want to take a close look at when I got to Tallahassee and talk to the stakeholders about it. But what I'll tell you right now is I would not, I would, I would not support um, a piece of legislation like that. Margaret? Well, I'm a lawyer. I believe in the Second Amendment, but I believe that we need comprehensive um, we need comprehensive gun regulation to make sure that our schools are safe, that the places that we enjoy going are safe. These mass shootings that have happened um, over the past year have got to stop. Is, is part of the size of these magazines that we saw in Orlando and in Las Vegas part of the problem? You know, I think that might be part of it, but there's things that we can do in, in Tallahassee now to strengthen our gun regulations. There's laws that are already on the books that aren't being enforced. For instance, if you were um, convicted of do domestic violence, part of what the judge can do is um, make you give up your guns, but you, you don't, don't have to give them up to the sheriff. You can give them up to your father or to your brother. And that, those kinds of, um, there's laws on the, on the books now that we could use to really strengthen um, gun safety. Allison? Well, Alan, I'm also a strong supporter of the Second Amendment, but I don't think that limiting uh, magazines would h help anyone. Um, it's a question of mental health is really what, what we're going towards. And um, trying to limit the tools of which someone uh, commits these horrors is not going to help us. And I think we need to take a close look at mental health and not so much the tools. You brought me to my next question. How and should you uh, restrict individuals who have a documented history of mental or emotional problems from owning a firearm but haven't been judged as mentally ill by a court of law. Margaret? You know, that's a good question that we need to look at really hard. We need to look hard at and see what we can do to, I mean, I think part of this is um, a health care issue. There are so many people in Florida that have mental illnesses and they don't have anywhere to go because the state has cut funding for mental health. I think we need to increase our funding for mental health care. I think that could help a lot with the problem. Allison, should you restrict gun ownership from people who may have emotional or mental issues that have not been adjudicated by a court of law? You know, that's a tough question and it's also a slippery slope. Um, we might see that the court of law isn't really um, educated on mental health and uh, a mental health professional might need to be brought in. Um, I don't know the, quite the answer on that because it is uh, a very complex subject. There's a variety of mental health il uh, illnesses and I don't know if that's something that the legislator needs to have a hand in. James, we have seen a, n a number of these uh, mass shootings where neighbors and friends of the individual responsible said we knew that there were problems. I think that was the situation involving that terrible shooting in Texas. So should you be able to restrict gun ownership if there's not a court finding uh, on a mental health issue? Well, um, as it relates to mental health, I, I believe we have a, an, a problem in this country with, with mental health, especially uh, especially amongst the, the younger generation. But I do believe, as far as mental health is concerned, if, if someone uh, has had a mental health, health issue and it, it's been properly documented, I think that's certainly something we should take a look at. All right, I think I have time for one more question. And uh, it's about states' rights. You know, it, that's important to Floridians. And we seem to rail against Washington handing down uh, laws and things that uh, we have to do here in Florida. But uh, a lot of folks here uh, are, are pointing to the Florida legislature considering several bills this session that would strip counties and municipalities of their ability to govern themselves. The Florida League of Cities says there are nine bills. In the last few years, Florida has passed laws that punish local governments that adopt gun restrictions, limit the ability of municipalities to regulate vacation rentals, businesses and building land use, and prohibit uh, sales of plastic bags. So if you don't have a problem with Tallahassee telling Sarasota what to do, wouldn't that make you hypocritical in terms of railing against what Washington orders us to do, James? Well, Alan, um, as it relates to uh, local laws, I believe it's best handled at the local level. Now, it's on a case-by-case -case basis, but what I'll tell you is uh, I support uh, a lot of this being handled at the local level. All right, Allison. I think we can almost all agree that we're tired of top-down government. Uh, we see the federal government get an insurance. We're seeing the state get into things like, I don't know, sanctuary cities. And um, it's, it's making everybody very anxious about it. And I think that oh, we need to cre keep control locally here and make sure that the state of Florida doesn't do too much. 
Um, I think moving the moving power into Tallahassee is another one of the ways that the legislature is not working for us. If you look at what has happened over the past several years, there's a bill right now that um, great Senator Suvi put forth to regulate whether or not you can uh, cut down trees in your backyard in Tallahassee in his opinion, should regulate that. That's not how our government should work. The government is best when it's closest to the people. In the county government, you have five county commissioners that you can go to that live in Sarasota. Why should we move those local decisions up to Tallahassee? You know, I'm gonna ask a quick question from the former person who held this uh, seat, Ray Pilon, who asks each and every one of you, have you ever gone to ha Tallahassee and sat in on a committee hearing and know how a bill is actually passed into law. Allison. I've gone to Tallahassee, but I haven't sat in a committee meeting there, but I have seen them on live streams and I watch them regularly, yes. James. I've been to Tallahassee and I've, I'm aware of how a bill's passed. Have you been to a committee meeting? I've not been to a committee meeting, no. All right, Margaret. Um, before I went to law school, I worked at the Florida Agricultural Center and Horse Park Authority, and I helped um, get a license plate passed that, whose funds then go to help fund the um, nonprofit um, public-private partnership that I worked for. So I helped draft that bill and sat in the committee meetings, um, and then ultimately it was passed. All right. We have to take a quick break, and we'll be back with the debate in a moment right after we check the first alert weather. Welcome back, everyone. You are watching the first and only debate between all three candidates in the House of the Two Special Election, Democrat Margaret Good, Libertarian Allison Foxall, and Republican James Buchanan. James, I want to pick up on something that you were talking about before. You don't like Tallahassee tell, telling our local cities and towns what to do. So why should the state legislature tell, let's say, Sarasota what to do in terms of sanctuary cities? Well, as far as sanctuary cities is concerned, this is an issue I'm very passionate about. I think the number one priority needs to be safety and security here in Sarasota, not only here in Sarasota, but throughout the state. So as I mentioned in that response, I said it's, I don't believe that across the board. There's, there's nuance to it, but I do think as far as sanctuary cities are concerned, we should not have any sanctuary cities here in the state of Florida. And that is something, if I'm elected to Tallahassee, I will fight each and every day to make sure we do not have a sanctuary city so here in Florida. So the law in Sarasota has to be the same as the law in Tampa? As it relates, are you, as it relates to sanctuary cities, yes. We have, laws, we have laws in this country. We shouldn't, we shouldn't be harboring illegal, uh, illegal immigrants. But that's a federal issue. We shouldn't be harboring illegal, but we need to enforce the laws. And if elected, I will work with Tom Knight who I'm proud to have his endorsement uh, to make sure that we're, we're keeping our streets safe and secure. Margaret, same question to you. You know, I think it's important to remember that we are a country of immigrants, but let me be clear. If someone commits a crime in Sarasota or in Florida, they should be punished, and it does not matter what your immigration status is at that point. I think as far as home rule and sanctuary cities goes, that's yet another example of the legislature trying to tell local governments what to do. And I leave it to local law enforcement and the federal government to, um, to follow the law. Allison? I think it's important to um, uh, have home rule uh, still, and I definitely support local governments uh, really doing what they'd like to do. But I do support um, Tom Knight's decision to enforce federal immigration laws. I think uh, I don't want to see Sarasota to be a sanctuary city, but that's completely up to the city and the counties across the state. Margaret, um, Governor Rick Scott has banned state employees from using the term climate change in official business. Would you be supportive of a law banning the governor from banning certain language of scientists? <laughs> That's an excellent question. Um, you know, I think that climate change is real. I know climate change is real. We have a real issue across Florida with hurricanes and with sea level rise that we need to address. And you cannot address it until you recognize the, the issue. And I think um, when 
Governor Scott decided that we should not talk about climate change, he was doing a real disservice to Floridians. James, same question to you. Should, would you be supportive of a law banning the governor from banning certain scientific terms like climate change? I believe climate change is real as well as, as a kid. I, I, in high school, I worked actually at Moat Marine and I helped take care of uh, two of the resident manatees, of whom are still there. You know, so I am a man of science and I do believe that's a real issue. I also believe drilling off our coast is another issue that we need to make sure that w we ban. That's nothing we should, we should be dealing with moving into the future. Another thing is we need to make sure we're funding to make sure we have funds for, to uh, re-nourish our beaches. So you would vote for a law that bans the governor from banning terms like climate change? Yeah, I don't think there's any, yeah. I, I don't think there's, as far as banning terms, yeah, I'd, I'd be against that. Allison, same question to you. I don't think the governor has any business telling anyone what word they can and cannot use. Uh, so I think that's more of a violation of free speech. Uh, but as far as climate change goes, the climate is definitely always changing. So yes, it does exist. But as far as can the government do anything about it, I think that's still out for debate. Allison, let me ask you the next question here. One of the biggest issues on the Sun Coast is development, overdevelopment. Um, a couple of years ago, in 2011, the state legislature, in its infinite wisdom, eliminated a state requirement that new development may not be approved by local governments unless the roads are adequately serving that development and impacting the surrounding area. Do you think the state legislature should reverse that, and if you have large new developments here on the Sun Coast, that the developers must pay for those, that, that infrastructure? Well, I think the developers do need to pay for the infrastructure. After all, they're developing it. Um, so I definitely think that should be left to the private sector. Um, and that's something that also the local counties and governments should have control of and not the state. James, was it a mistake for the legislature to get rid of that requirement? I think, as it relates to this, uh, we, we have a major traffic issue, not, not only here but across the state. So this is a real issue as it relates to infrastructure and traffic. And I believe as far as development, we should make sure that we have a proper infrastructure if we're going to develop, absolutely. Well, again, should the developers be required to pay for those roads and lights around these new developments that are cropping up all over the area like they used to? I think that they, we need to have the infrastructure in place if we're going to be, if we're going to continue to develop, no question about it. But you're not certain who should pay for it? What I'm telling you is I think we can't continue to develop if we don't have the proper infrastructure in place, Alan. Margaret, same question to you. So it's a no-brainer. You should not build houses until you have roads and until you have schools in place. Back, you know, t 10 years ago, we had the Growth Management Act, which required local governments to uh, create comprehensive plans. And then there was some state oversight to make sure that those comprehensive plans were actually um, used and that the local governments did what they said they were going to do. Um, and part of that um, was to make sure that if, if a developer was going to develop, that they paid their share of the, of the roads and uh, of the infrastructure that needs to be put in place. I think that's really important. This should be, it should be a partnership between a local government um, and the developer to figure out what's going to work for, for, the, for Sarasota or the cities that are developing. I'm going to ask you all a quick question, quick responses, because we're coming up to a, a, a break. But we got great questions from our audience over the last few days. Kathy would like to ask, should taxpayer money go to profit charter or private schools? Allison. Private schools, no, but charter schools, yes, because they are technically part of the public school James. system. As it relates to that, it, our money should be going towards our public school system and towards uh, charter schools. Margaret. So uh, last session, um, House Bill 7069 passed, and that bill requires our local government to give money to for-profit charter schools. Those for-profit charter schools can buy land, they can build infrastructure with our taxpayer dollars, and then they can close. And where does our, where does our tax money right. go? We Into could, the pro pockets of the CEOs. We could pick a, uh, that, this up, but we have to take a break. We'll have to take a short break. The House 72 debate continues in a moment. Stay with us.
Welcome back, everyone. You are watching the first and only debate between all three candidates in the House 72 special election, Democrat Margaret Good, Libertarian Allison Foxall, and Republican James Buchanan. We have a lot to get through in this block, but we're going to pick up where we left off, and I'm going to ask it in a form of a question. Uh, Margaret Shirley asks, what is your stand on public schools and vouchers? So I believe in our public education system. It is one of the most important things that, that the state of Florida and that our local governments do. Sarasota has one of the best public education systems in the state, but there are still children that lag behind. And our public education funding has been flat. We are now sending money from our public education system to for-profit charter schools. By 2020, we're going to be spending almost a billion dollars on, on a voucher program, and those voucher schools are not being held accountable. It's hard for me to imagine that Mr. Buchanan is going to fight for our public school system when he is, has aligned himself with Rick Scott and the establishment Republicans that want to move to uh, privatize our education system. James, you have a minute to respond. I do, I do. Uh, Margaret, we have, in 2017, we had record spending on our public school system, $20.4 billion on the public school system. And let me just take one step further. If a child's being bullied, if a child has a learning disability, and the parents believe that they should be in a different environment, it should be in the parents' hands, not in the hands of bureaucrats to decide that. Allison, your turn. So I actually went through the public school system here in Sarasota. Um, I went to Booker High, and I love my teachers, but there are some problems in the classroom. We teach to a test, and I think that needs to stop. Charter schools, however, are doing very well here in Sarasota, and I think we need to continue to fund them. But when you look at other places in the state, like Broward County, for instance, there's a lot of corruption from Democrats there, and we need to stop them somehow. I'm not sure how, but... We need to look at that for certain. Okay, I want to ask another big uh, question on a big issue, and then I want to get to some questions about each one of you individually. Uh, and I'm going to start with this. A Florida judge earlier this month blocked and declared unconstitutional a law passed by the legislature requiring a woman to delay an abortion by at least 24 hours after making a visit to the doctor and who would have to inform her of the possible risks of the procedure. So the question is, uh, do uh, you support any law that either restricts or uh, or expands uh, abortion rights in Florida, Allison? So, personally, I am pro-life, morally speaking, but on a policy standpoint, I'm pro-choice. Um, I don't think putting these limitations in place is going to help um, anyone, especially the mother. Um, but I do uh, abhor the. Uh, insinuation that somebody would use abortion as a birth control method. I think it's a, more of a last-ditch effort uh, in regarding uh, the woman's life. James, same question, given the, the facts that we laid out there. Would you support any law that restricts abortion rights or expands them? I think the decisions met best made between the mother, her family, and, and the, the pastor or their priest, um, that, that's how I personally feel. I, I am pro-life. And so, um, so personally, I'm pro-life, but that's, that's my general opinion on that. All right, Margaret? Women's health care decisions should be made between a doctor and the woman, the patient. They should not be part of what the government is deciding. Okay. Allison, let me ask you this question, and it also came from uh, one of our viewers who uh, say that they do like you, they like what you stand for, but is voting for a libertarian in their words, a throwaway vote uh, because you know pu public opinion polls show it's a real contest between James and, and Margaret. What is a person to do if they want their vote to really have an impact on this race? Alan, a wasted vote is only voting for someone that you don't believe in. It's not, I believe that wasting your vote is voting for someone like a Republican or a Democrat that they don't really want. They're just voting against somebody else. And so I believe that your vote counts everywhere, whether you want to vote for a different party or someone nonpartisan. That's completely up to them, and it's what they believe in. Margaret, one of our viewers also asked uh, about uh, this involving your stance on the environment. Uh, but in, in a recent interview, Mr. Buchanan pointed out that is it a contradiction to be pro-environment and take money from developers? 
So I am so proud of the campaign that we have run. We have over 2,000 individual contributors that believe in this campaign and want to see it move forward. If you contrast that with Mr. Buchanan's last reporting period, he had 16 actual people, and the rest of the money that came in was from businesses and corporations, and a number of those 16 people were his family members. James, I'll, oh, I'm sorry, did we, did, were you finished there, or? Uh, go ahead. Okay, James, let me give you a chance to respond Okay, to well, let me just respond to that. Um, as, let me just start off by saying um, a majority of the funding that you've received has come from over the state line. You've, you've taken a lot of money from California, New York, and D.C. And the money you haven't taken out of the state, you've taken over $100,000 from a local developer. A single developer has given you over $100,000. So I want to know what you've promised him. Uh, let me give you 30 seconds to yeah. respond. Um, so I believe that you are talking about Hugh Culver Culverhouse. Hugh Culverhouse is a friend of the of environmentalist. He supports the Sierra Club. He supports community associations. Um, he led the charge on saving salary fields. He wants me to win because he doesn't want another Buchanan in office. And he is fed up with what's happening in Tallahassee, and that's why he's supporting this campaign. Okay, and James, to you, you've been saying that you are your own man, but your financial disclosure lists only $23,000 in income in 2016, despite having two mortgages in excess of a million dollars. Um, is that qualifications to be a state representative, or are you, you know, leaning back on your family name and the fact that your father is, is the congressman to be a front runner in this race? Well, I, I think that's, uh, it's kind of a two-parter you're asking me. So let me start off with the first part. Uh, my father is from a blue collar family. He's, grow, he's grown up, uh, served his country, and he's um, lived the American dream. And he's done a great job uh, working for the people here in this area, and I'm very proud of him. Uh, as it relates to the second part, I'm a small business owner. And so I understand a lot of the issues that small business owners face. I've had good years, I've had bad off years, and I've had years where I've reinvested in my company. And this was one of those years. Okay. Uh, one quick question, and it comes from Kurt. Would you be supportive of a law that uh, proposed by uh, Senator Greg Stubbe uh, to, support, uh, to support arming classroom teachers in public schools? James? Alan, that's a great question. I am 100% Second Amendment. I, I'm pro-Second Amendment. Um, as it relates to that issue, that's something I want to uh, examine when I get up in Tallahassee and talk to all the st stakeholders involved. So you're not ruling that out? Yes. All right. Allison? I think it's their constitutional right to carry arms and uh, protect our children, but I think that decision needs to be up to the school board. Okay. Margaret? Alan, I do not believe that guns have a place in schools. I think that the best way to protect our children is to make sure that we're providing safe environments in our public education, in our public schools, and providing guns is not part of that. Okay, let me ask a real, again, a quick question. We could, uh, and try to get this in, in the block. What types of policies would you support to reverse climate change by not damaging the environment any uh, f uh, further and keeping Florida from sinking into the Gulf? <laughs> Margaret? Um, I, I think that there's short-term solutions and there's long-term. In the short-term, we need to look at, the look at our infrastructure and make sure that we can, that we're prepared for the next big t storm. Long term, we need to look at reducing carbon emissions. We need to start moving towards solar energy. And we need to make sure that we are, are pr protecting and preserving land because that's so important, not only for our quality of life, but also for our water. Allison. We definitely need to make sure that we're not over pumping our aquifers. Um, that's definitely something we need to look at. We don't have any regulations as far as I know regarding that. So we should take a look for okay. sure. James, we only have a few seconds left. I, I would encourage us to um, continue to fund Amendment 1 and make sure um, that uh, Forever Florida is also funded. Those are two, uh, two areas I would advocate for. Okay, we have to leave it there. When we return, closing statements. Stay with us. Welcome back, everyone. Time for closing statements, and we begin with Margaret Good. Margaret. 
Alan, thank you again so much for having us on. I think it's so important to have, have these public discussions. And I hope that this is not the, la the last one. There's actually a forum coming up on February 5th in Siesta Key, and Allison and I will be there. And I would like to invite James Buchanan to come. Um, but I think the, the choice is clear here. You, you can vote for someone who is going to work to defund our public education system, who's not going to fight for our environment, and who's going to not um, provide us the health care that we deserve. Or you can vote for, uh, vote for someone that's going to do what's really good for Sarasota. And when I get to Tallahassee, I'm going to be guided by three principles. I'm going to do what's good for our families, what's good for the environment, and what's good for the economy. So I ask the voters of District 72 to support me on February 13th with their vote. All right, James, you're up. Well, thank you, Alan, again for, for a great night. And Margaret and Allison, I, I enjoyed our time together. As I mentioned in my opening, I believe we're at a crossroads here. As a father, as a uh, husband, as someone that has a small business here, and someone that grew up in this community, I tr strongly believe we, we're at a turning point. And are we going to move backwards or are we going to continue to move forwards? When elected, I will work each and every day to make sure that we have good paying jobs, we have safety and security in our, our, our community, which means we're not going to be a sanctuary city, and better opportunities for future generations. And that's what my campaign's been all about. I hope to have your vote on February 13th, and I will continue to work hard for it. Allison, you have 90 seconds. Thank you, Alan, and thank you, Margaret. Thank you, James, for uh, this time. It was, it was, it's been fun. Uh, I'm a person of honesty. I'm direct. I don't beat around the bush or hedge. I'm not a politician. I'm a regular, homegrown, working Sarasota woman. And I'm a libertarian. I'm someone who believes in freedom for all, not just for some. This is an opportunity for the voters of District 72. It's not a wasted vote if you vote for me. It's voting for someone that you believe in. And I believe that someone is me. I think the two-party system is broken in this country, and I think that needs to change. I believe that we need to prosper in Florida, and that means deregulation, deregulation of our uh, occupations, health care, so we can afford the things that we desperately need here in Florida. I desperately need your vote as well, of course. There's 25% of people here in the district that are unrepresented. They're independent. They have no party affiliation. And I believe that I'm their representation. So I ask everyone to vote for me this February 13th, else we'll be stuck with this and this. <laughs> okay. Well, that will do. And I want to thank all of you for being here tonight. This has been absolutely terrific and exactly what the voters des uh, deserve uh, as they head to the polls two weeks from today. Margaret Good, Allison Fox Hall, James Buchanan, we want to thank all of you for being here tonight. Everyone jumping into the arena should be commended. You all did a fantastic job. And now, folks, it is up to you. You have heard from the candidates. Go out there and vote. Thanks for joining us. For all of us here at ABC7, good night.